November 10th, 1975. The bulk freighter Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior, Canada with all 29 hands. This sinking has become part of Canadian and U.S. folklore due mainly to a song written by Canadian songwriter Gordon Lightfoot. For copyright reasons, we will not play it here, but I agree it's a great song, although the lyrics do contain some inaccuracies. In this episode of World's Greatest Maritime Disasters, The Sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. <laughs> largest freighter on the Great Lakes, built in 1957 in River Rouge, Michigan. The Fitz, as it was known, left Superior, Wisconsin on her last trip on November 9, 1975, with a cargo of 26,000 tons of taconite pellets. That's a rock containing about 15% iron used in steel production. She was heading to Detroit. She was traveling with another freighter the Arthur M. Anderson, owned by United States Steel Corporation. They encountered heavy weather in the early evening of November 10th, and the fix finally sank about 17 miles west of Whitefish Bay. She sank only 17 years after she was first commissioned. Captain Ernest M. McSorley of the Fitz had radioed he was having difficulty and was taking on water. The ship was listing to port, that's on the left side of the ship facing forward, and had both ballast pumps working. The radar had been damaged and was not working. Also, there was damage to the ballast tank vent pipes, and he was overheard on the radio saying it was the worst storm he had ever seen. All 29 officers and crew, including a Great Lakes Maritime Academy cadet went down with the ship, which lies broken into sections about 530 feet of water. The captain of the Arthur M. Anderson reported the suspected loss to the Coast Guard that night, but there are many theories about just why the Edmund Fitzgerald sank. In 1976, the wreck was surveyed by the U.S. Coast Guard using a U.S. Navy CURV-3 system, a remotely operated unmanned underwater vessel. The wreckage consisted of an upright bow section approximately 275 feet long and an inverted stern section about 253 feet long. There was a debris field with the rest of the hull in between. Both sections lie within 170 feet of one another. The National Transportation Safety Board unanimously voted on March 23, 1978 to reject the U.S. Coast Guard's official report supporting the theory that the sinking was caused by faulty hatches. Later, the NTSB revised its verdict and reached a majority vote to agree that the sinking was caused by taking on water through one or more hatch covers damaged by the impact of heavy seas over her deck. This is contrary to the Lake Carriers Association contention that her foundering was caused by flooding through the bottom and ballast tank damage resulting from bottoming out on the Six Fathom Shoal between Caribou and Michi Picotin Island. It is possible to hit bottom in heavy seas and waves are measured from trough to crest with the depth stated on the charts being somewhere in the middle. The reports on the storm that night say there was a very high wind. The Great Lakes don't have tides, but there is an effect called seiches that can cause a water level to drop suddenly and dramatically during storms. The U.S. Coast Guard reported on August 2nd, 1977, citing a faulty hatch cover lack of watertight cargo hold bulkhead, and damage caused from an undetermined source. Another published theory contends that an already weakened structure 
due to several previous collisions in contact with locks and modification of the Fitzgerald winter load line that allows heavier loads to travel lower in the water made it possible for large waves to cause a stress fracture in the hull. This is based on the regular huge waves of the storm and does not necessarily involve rogue waves as some people have suggested. On that fateful night, Captain McSorley learned from Captain Cedric Woodward, a U.S. pilot aboard a Swedish ship called Avatars that was 10 miles ahead, that neither the light nor directional radio beacon called the Loran at Whitefish Point were working. Captain Woodward, who knew McSorley and had talked to him on the radio in previous times, stated that he did not recognize the voice when they first spoke and that McSorley sounded strange. About 6 p.m., Woodward called the Fitz to report that the light had just gone on. Traditionally, vessels having trouble call a pan-pan, a radio call on a distress channel to tell everyone nearby and the Coast Guard that there is trouble on board. The term is believed to come from pan or broken in French. When a vessel and crew are in peril, they call a mayday, again from French made or help me. No radar, and years before GPS, without any visual contact, and with the only navigation system at the time not working, the ship indeed was in peril. Whatever took her to the bottom, it must have happened suddenly, as the Edmund Fitzgerald never made that mayday call, and there was no attempt by the crew to abandon ship. I'm Alan Stokel. Thank you for watching.